these out to update your information. Uh, start a new mailing list, hopefully with, uh, I mean, it was a, when we went through the list, sadly enough, there was eight or nine people that have left us that were on the list. So, uh, and so anyways, if you have one, people are paying their dues. It really isn't due yet, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, and what, what that will be will be uh, starting next September, that next year. They keep coming in. How are you? Good. Nice and good. Yeah. 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 Okay, what I'd like to do is kind of reorganize and start a board of directors like we had once before. Um, what I'm looking for, when do you still want to be a director? Okay, well we started this a long time ago. I'm looking for a vice president, assistant secretary, mainly because we're not gonna fire you this. But it's about time after 20 years that we put the records on computer. Right now they're all handwritten. Yeah. So Eunice doesn't do computers. Even though when you were the secretary to the president of Regal Shoe, right? Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> well, I'm trying to make you look good. I know. <laughs> but anyway, and I need a historian, which be, might be the museum curator, uh, a couple of directors. Uh, we need a chair. We need a chair. Room over there, here. Yeah. A program, a newsletter editor. Thank you. I brought this along because this maybe five or six years ago we used to put this out quarterly. A newsletter would have some articles about some history of Lincoln and uh, whatnot. So I'm looking for somebody to put that all together uh, with the information. Uh, we can find them. As long as I have a print shop, we can print it. <laughs> but, uh, so that's what I'm looking for. As I say, the, the board, you can look here and sign up if you want to be a member of the board. But things still happen that I read in this past couple of weeks, I read into a couple of things. Marie called me up and said, when's the meeting? And I told her. And she said, well, do you remember what the, uh, 
the Hotel Gordon Grand in once. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I think it was on the corner of Washington and Temple. Yeah. So. About the back corner. Well, anyways, yeah, because what happened to be the back corner? This is the book, and all you got to do is look up in this book, and it tells you uh, Grandin Hotel in 1880 was known as the Bates in the Standish, corner of South Avenue and Temple Street, Northeast Corner. South Avenue. But anyways, over the past 50 years, I worked with a lot of talented people in Whitman. We put this book together in 1975. We put this book together in 1985. We put this book, uh, David Hickey did most of it with my help. And uh, in 2000, they all. This one is more pictures. It has to now. Well, these books have a lot of history in them. A lot of things you can find out that not everybody will remember. But uh, they are, and these are out of print. I don't. We don't have any more. But when people. Uh, parents die and they clean out their homes, I get more books. <laughs> so I get to resell them and have had a lower cost. But I also got a, the same day you called Marie, about two days later I got a call from the police department. And they said, we got no history of the police department. You know, there's nothing in the station here, nobody knows anything. So she went to the clerk and they found out when it was started. But uh, if you open this book here, it takes you through 85, and then it takes you through 85, uh, 75, and then up to 85 in these books of all the department people. And uh, that's what I mean. There's a lot of that is right in these books. There's a lot of things I'm not too worried about that, you know. I've been up here for so long. For the information that you want, want to know, we have a checkbook balance of $6,132. We have a certificate of deposit of $2,700. So we have money. Uh, a lot of people, I get donations, and I get the sale of these books, and those books still happen on a regular basis. So we have money to do things. Uh, it cost us where the museum now is probably cost us four forty five hundred dollars to set it up because we had to put new walls in and labor and everything to set the museum up as it is. And for those people that haven't been down to the museum, just call me and uh, I'll open it up for you. Uh, when you're walking through the boulevard, just come in because it, it's a uh, it's in pretty good shape right now. So we'll see where that goes. Ah, I think that kind of fills me up. We have a speaker tonight. <laughs> this, this gentleman here deals me out all the time. This guy can speak on just about anything. And uh, tonight I asked him to speak on the uh, Park Avenue School, uh, Park Avenue Estate. That was a mansion. That, where the school is now, and that stood. It was the last owner was J.J. Clark, but he also owned the Whitman Foundry, and he owned the National Fireworks. And Leslie is going to talk about uh, different things that those uh, National Fireworks and what the Foundry made. And then, as we know, the, the estate there, it was put up for sale for $60,000, and it didn't go in 1947. And those ads, uh, Leslie had the sales brochure, that's why I got the pictures. And it sold, it didn't sell, so finally he sold it to the town for $12,000. So that's how they got that lot of land, and then the town destroyed that building to build that school. So Leslie, yeah, right. That was quick. A five-minute business meeting. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I'm pleased to be back with you again. Uh, I spoke here, I think, in 1984, up on the second or third floor of a different building, at which time I met Barbara Packard, and she was my good friend for many years. <laughs> um, and I was back in your new museum just a few years ago. <laughs> oh, uh, and I had a slide program. Um, I have been gathering information about the National Fireworks for almost 50 years now. I, I moved, I used to live in Whitman. I lived in a little brick cape on the corner of Rainer Avenue and Cherry Street. And uh, I lived there for two years. And uh, at 5 o'clock every day, the stack would open at the Whitman Foundry, and the neighborhood be, <laughs> would be enveloped in uh, acrid smoke. And since I had allergies, I wasn't going to be able to tolerate that for too long. So I only lived there for two years. But uh, I've been gathering history of National Fireworks since I moved to Hanover in 1975. And I was on the Conservation Commission, and the Conservation Commission uh, had acquired 100 and something acres of former fireworks land. And uh, for 13 years, I was on the <coughs> Conservation Commission, and I walked that whole area, digging up things, shells and stuff. And uh, now, if you follow the news, uh, it's been it's been fenced off for years. It's hazardous waste, and there's explosives. And when I think for 13 years, I was digging there and uh, bringing home shells. Fortunately, I had people in the fire department who uh, would tell me whether the shells were, were alive or not. So that got me interested in, in the National Fireworks. And of course, George J.J. Clark was the founder of National Fireworks. And uh, he did live in Whitman, Whitman for a period of time. Uh, I was asked to talk about Quark and about the foundry. And I'm going to start with, with uh, a little bit of information about George J.J. Quark. Uh, if you're into genealogy and you don't belong to Ancestry.com, you really should join. Um, it's been like. 20 years since I did any of my research. All this stuff isn't stuck in a closet. And I went on to Ancestry.com yesterday and uh, found all about George J.J. J. Clark, which I'm going to share with you. I'm going to start with the end, and then I'll go to the beginning. George J.J. J. Clark of Whitman, deceased at age 98. Funeral services for George J.J. J. Clark of 975 Washington Street, former owner of the National Fireworks Company, West Hanover, will be at 10.30 a.m. Monday in the First Baptist Church, Rockland. He died Thursday. This is 1965. He was born in 1866. Uh, if you know your Whitman streets, 975 Washington Street is a little... Uh, ranch, not too far from the end of Washington Street, up on the on the Abington end. I haven't been by there in many years. It may not be a ranch anymore. It may not be there, but that's where he ended up. Uh, born in Prince Edward Island, Canada, he resided for many years in one of Whitman's largest estates at South End Park Avenue, and that's it. Uh, I would suspect he was the richest man in Whitman at that period of time. Uh, when he was uh, running the fireworks during World War II, he was making $130,000 a year, which was real good money for 1941. He lived in Hanson for 10 years, returning to Whitman four years ago. For many years, he was chairman of the Whitman Town Finance Committee. He was really good at finance. Uh, in, the, in the 50 years that he ran that company, uh, he did all sorts of interesting things. He organized the Hanover Fire Department in 1914. Well, that's not quite correct. He organized the fire department for West Hanover, 
because the fireworks had explosions rather often. And so he bought big fire engines and had them stationed right there in Drinkwater on, on King Street. He was a 32nd degree Mason. He belonged to Phoenix Lodge in Hanover and recently received his 50 year badge at the age of 98. He started late. He leaves his wife, Mrs. Elizabeth M. Flanders. This was his second wife. Uh, he married her when he was like 94. Uh, she was considerably younger and she became considerably wealthy when he <laughs> went on to the <laughs> nether world. Four sons, George of St. Petersburg, Florida, William M. and Stanley H., both of West Hanover, and Milton C. of Hanson, two brothers, uh, Newman and L.W. of Clearwater, Florida. So that's the end. The beginning, he was born in 1867 in Prince Edward Island. My father came from Prince Edward Island, so that interested me. And so I looked up and uh, he was born in Lot 3, Prince County. If you know Prince Edward Island, it's way up the, the left end, the, uh, the west end up near Tignish. Uh, farming country, his parents were farmers, as were most people down there. Potatoes was their crop. Uh, my father, his father was a, was a farmer. Everybody was a farmer down there. Uh, and Scotch, Scotch ancestry. Let me get this off of here. So that's, that I got from Canadian records. August 24th, 1898, he was in Abington. And when he came to, to this country, he started a builder supply company in North Abington. Uh, if you know where they, what's the big building there? Used to have cards, used to make. New England Art. New England Art. Well, it's, it's to the east of that. I believe it's Marble Street. And so I have a, a piece of stationery, George J.J. J. Clark and Company, Builders Finish, build, Moldings, Brackets, sawing, turning, and that's August of 1898. September of 1898, uh, marriage records. George J.J. J. Clark, age 30, birthplace Alberton, PEI. He got married on September the 7th in Abington. 1900, federal census. He was living at 8 Harrison Avenue in Abington, and he was renting there. And he had one son at that point, Oliver. Then we have 1905, uh, George J.J. J. Clark, by occupation, fireworks maker, an alien and free white person, uh, is now about 38 years of age. He arrived in Boston about the first day of November, 1890. And now he renounces his British citizenship, and he is becoming a citizen of the United States, 1905. He was already in business uh, in fireworks by then. In 1899, he bought the old anchor works in Hanover uh, on, fact on Forge Pond. Uh, it had burned. No, it burned after he bought it. Uh, and he started making fireworks. And for a while, he was doing the furniture and the fireworks. Evidently, there was a fireworks manufacturer before him at that location. And I've researched that. The guy had been in business in Rockland. And Rockland didn't want fireworks because they were more built up. And uh, so they passed an ordinance that you couldn't have fireworks manufacture in Rockland. So the guy moved to Hanover, and business wasn't good, and George J.J. J. Clark took it over. 1910, George J.J. J. Clark was living on King Street in Hanover. And his industry, it says, was furniture and fireworks. Quite a mix. 1920 census, he had bought a house on King Street. If you know King Street in Hanover and you know the old brick 
Fireworks Administration Building, the house just to the left of that was the house where he bought and where he raised his children. And by the 1920 census, he had sons Oliver, George, William, and Stanley. George James John, those were his middle names. This is his Masonic uh, membership, initiated in 1917, passed 1919. He got his Vets Medal in 1963. 1926, Whitman Directory. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. George J.J. J. Clark appear as 274. It doesn't give the street, and Dyer Avenue is the one above it, but I think 274 was this address. Yeah. What? Yes, that was Park. Good, okay. So 1926 was his arrival here, and if you look at the sales brochure here, you'll see that the house was remodeled in 1926. Uh, I don't know when it was built, and it's gone, so there's probably nothing in the assessor's records now, but many of the houses around there were built between 1895 and 1900. So I suspect that this was uh, built during that period of time. And I'd be curious to know who did build it, because that is a, a huge house. Uh, yes? It was originally owned by the Wynn family, W-H-I-D-D-E-N. Okay, I have to stop and write things down. Spell that again. W-H-I-D-D-E-N. Wind. The Wind family estate, yeah. And what did they do for a living, I wonder? I don't know. Yeah. We'll have to find out. We have a Wind Ave in Wind, too, a Wind Ave. Yeah. Up off of Raymond Street, not far from where you live. Okay. So they had some sort of a significant business, I would imagine. We'll have to look it up. And the 1937, 1930 federal census, he was at 274, and the house value was $26,000 in 1930. Um, and so that's that part. But now, where is page one? Okay, so he lived in Abington, he moved to Hanover, then he moved to Whitman, then he lived for 10 years in Hanson, and then for his last four years he moved back to Whitman to the little house on Washington Street. Um, so that's the story of George J.J. Now, what about the foundry? Well, I don't know when the foundry was started, but National Fireworks bought it. I have the date somewhere, but I couldn't find it. It's 1910, 1908. It's fairly, fairly early on in, in his business. And they manufactured a wide variety of things. This is a catalog. Gray iron castings for decorating. And national coatings have attained Unusual popularity among gift shops, decorators, and individuals buying for personal use because of their wide variety and beauty of design. Also, their uniform high quality. And it was high quality. Uh, I was in the antique business for a very long time. And door stops was one of the things that uh, we would frequently find. And there were many companies that made cast iron doorstops, but nationals were of exceptionally good quality. Uh, it says, we sell undecorated castings only. Those unacquainted with the best method of decorating gray iron will find explicit directions on the last page of the catalog. These castings, although smooth, are not machine finished. Strong details and sharp hard lines are omitted purposely, the better to co copy the antique style in which most of the subjects are conceived. And this catalog shows they made bookends, 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 <laughs> doorstops, ashtrays, doorstops, again, doorstops, Doorstops were popular. 
more and more and more bookends again. If you're familiar with the foundry, what's in the front yard? The deer. The deer. Exceptionally large casting. They made horseshoes. They made lamps. They made paperweights, banks, candlesticks, boot jacks, tie backs, door knockers, candle holders, paperweights, snuffers, miscellaneous, elk head tie rack, a knight, a police dog. I've seen a number of those. Uh, much smaller, well, they're not that much smaller, but there's a lot of them around. In fact, I have one somewhere. Um, bulldogs were, were often very popular as well. What else? Grates for the fireplace. Doorstops, ships' bells, eagles, and irons. French bulldog puppies. Garden furniture. What year was that? That's a very good question. Um, I suspect it's around 1920, okay. but I, it is undated. It may be earlier than that. Owl and irons, cockatoos, lawn ornaments, there's the deer, and lions, and bird baths. And lawn urns and quoits. And let's see. And then helpful hints that teaches you how to paint the gray iron, putting on a priming coat of white paint, and it, it goes on to great detail. So that's one of the things, that's not one, many of the things they make. But the things that have always interested me are cap guns. And they made, well, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve different ones here. And there are, and there are many others. Um, they made cap canes, too. Anyone know what, what that was? Well, it was, it was a toy for the kids, you know? You, you put the cap in here and you fire it and... Uh, and they made the caps as well. This is a box of, of roll caps. And the roll caps were homework. Come on, out of there. That's one, two, three, four, five rolls. And the ladies rolled these at home at night. Uh, I many years ago saw one of the homemade things that they used to, to roll the caps. They would get long, long strings of caps and they would put the string on this, on this machine and they would roll it and it would roll it up and then there was a thing that would cut it off. And the caps would be moist so they would hang them above the wood stove and the next morning uh, now I'm thinking about that. The caps were moist when they were the long strip. And so they would dry them first, I think. I don't know. What I don't know, because I wasn't there back then. But well, I, the ladies did have caps hanging, drying in their homes by fire. Yeah. How prophetic that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, times were tough for many of these years. And, and a lot of the people who worked for the fireworks who came in the early part of that century, 1900. I mean, there was war in Europe then. And so there were many, many immigrants who came from Lithuania and Poland and other Eastern European countries. In fact, I've, I've heard the stories. I interviewed people 25 years ago who remembered their parents coming. They didn't know a word of English. And they would come in on the train from, Bra from Boston to, to Abington with something pinned on their clothes telling somebody, send to Hanover. And the immigrants who were already there, uh, I, I remember 
two of them, Agnes and Amelia Nawazowski. Uh, Agnes was a teacher in Hanover, as was I. And she wrote a history of her family, which included all the way back in Europe, and how they came to Brockton, and they bought this cape on King Street. And after they got going, they invited other people from Lithuania to come and live with them until they got, got established. And uh, many of these people didn't, didn't speak English. They went to church, I think, at St. Casimir's in, in Brockton. I'm not sure if that's the name of the church, but uh, they, they uh, and, and, the, and their descendants are all over the South Shore now, the great grandkids. Um, that's a wonderful story about the way it was 100 years ago when people came and they worked hard and they made a life for themselves. Uh, what is it? It's a cap gun. Well, what kind of a cap gun? There's no trigger. It's a water pistol. <laughs> a cast iron water pistol. So it had a bladder inside there, which dried up about 95 years ago, I'm sure. And uh, George J.J., um, he was a really smart guy. And he, he copied things that other people had done before him. Uh, this cap gun is not a national fireworks. It's patented June 30th, 1888. This cap pistol is a national liquid pistol. A little bit different, but uh, looks very much alike. And um, when, when Clark started the fireworks in 1899, 1900, he probably didn't know much about uh, the business. And it's my understanding that he employed people who went up to Weymouth and went to the fireworks company in Weymouth and copied what the machines looked like so that, uh, so that George could uh, ma manufacture his own machines. And the fireworks company in Weymouth was called Hunt Fireworks. And they had been in business from the 1850s. Uh, and uh, so this is one example of uh, creative copying, sort of like the Chinese do today. And then cap guns. The roll of caps goes in here. And uh, still works. And through the years, the, the cap guns appear different. This is one of my favorites. I like the, I like the finish on it, the blacking. And they actually made this one in colors, although the colored ones are really, really hard to find. And then there was some that were machine pistols. This one had a, had a crank that you cranked it, and it would fire off the caps quicker, which was good for George, because he sold more caps that way. And then there were the shiny ones, oops. And there were big ones. And the later ones, I didn't bring any of the later ones, but in the later part of the business, they didn't make them out of cast iron. They were made out of aluminum. And they were probably manufactured in New Bedford. Because as the company went on, uh, it morphed into national playthings and other things, um, so they had manufacturing facilities <coughs> elsewhere. This thing, back then, kids didn't have complicated toys to play with. Everything was, was pretty simple. A wood turning, and the fireworks had their own wood shop, and some fencing, and this thing was for sparklers. This was, this was uh, not in the early years, because in the early years, they weren't that concerned about hazardous things. But after the government started making you know, rules and regulations about safety, you put the sparkler inside this thing, <laughs> and it's supposed to save you from getting caught on fire. Um, 
And let's see, that's the very first catalog that they had in 1906. And they put out a number of other catalogs. They get bigger and bigger through the years. And the company got bigger and bigger through the years. Um, the company became really, really wealthy during the war years. In, in World War I, the company changed from manufacturing toys to manufacturing munitions. And George was really good at uh, designing things. And so they had government contracts that kept them going dur during World War I. And then during World War II, they, they grew even larger. They were employing 4,000 people down in West Hanover. And they were probably employing 30,000 people all over the country. They had branches in World War II in Chillicothe, Ohio, Mayfield, Kentucky, Memphis, Tennessee, Randolph, Mass, West Hanover, Mays Landing, Elkton, Maryland, Bristol, Virginia. All of these huge factories that were turning out uh, all sorts of munitions for the, for the war effort. Um, in Hanover, um, they did a lot with magnesium flares. There was along, if you know Hanover, along Winter Street was known as Mag Row. And they had rows of buildings. Notice how they're separated from each other. Uh, they didn't want too much explosives in one building because they did explode. And so they had small buildings scattered all over the property. And uh, Mag Row, to this day, still has the ground is white in places there because magnesium powder, when it oxidizes, turns into magnesium oxide, which is a, it's like rust. Rust is iron oxide, and magnesium oxide is, is the white stuff that's there. At one time, I owned land down there, and it was all covered with that. And people were afraid of the land because they thought it was bad. That's why I was able to buy it cheap. Uh, but other parts of the property have really, really nasty stuff, unexploded uh, material. Um, this cover photo here shows uh, the firing range. And they had this installation on King Street. The platform is still there off of King Street. And it aimed across the pond into an area where the target was placed. And they brought in various things. It's been said that there was a plane, not said, it was. There were planes that were put there. And they would shoot their ammunition at the planes to see if the ammunition would penetrate the uh, skin and blow up correctly. And it's this area that is the area of the cleanup that's going on, has been going on for five or six years now. And they have explosions every week, pretty much, because there's a lot of unexploded ordnance there. And the fireworks also owned hundreds of acres in Halifax, down in South Halifax. Cumberland Farm owned the land property, owned it afterwards. And I believe that it's publicly owned now. Um, but they used to shoot, they, they had a mile uh, long firing range. And I have heard that years ago, people would cut down timber in that area. And sometimes there would be explosions in their stove because ammunition would get stuck in the tree and it would grow around it. And then good luck. Um, Okay, what else do I have here? National Fireworks had, had a real bunch of buildings down there. They had a paper box factory, so they made all their own boxes. They had a print shop where they did their own artwork. I thought I would wear this today. Hanover Historical Society, I took this and I copied it and made it into this. And Hanover Historical Society sells these for $10 a shirt. 
if anybody's interested, I have small, medium, large, and extra large. <laughs> and let's see, National Foundry. This is one of the uh, bill heads from July of 1941 to Sam Salmond and Son. Uh, they were in business in Hanover for many years, and it's nine furnace bars. And the title here says, Gray Iron, Brass, and Aluminum Castings. High-grade castings are our specialties. Bookends, doorstops, and irons, and novelties. Phone, Whitman 618. <laughs> and that, I think, is... I did it, half hour, just like, <laughs> wasn't planned, it's totally random, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Yes? How many years did the Clarks live in that house, do you know? Well, it appears to me that it was from 26 to 54. Okay, so about 20 uh, it, it said somewhere, oh, he, his obituary said he lived in Hanson for 10 years. And I don't know where he lived in Hanson. His son, one of his sons lived on Brook Street. They had like 13 acres there. Uh, and so I'm thinking that may have been where it, where it was. Um, so that would be what, from 1926 to 54, he was in town here. Yeah. Before my time. Yeah, when did the, when did they? They bought it in 47, and they voted to put a school there in 51. So it might have been there a couple of years before they tore it down. Okay, so that leads me to wonder, if he lived in Whitman from 26 to 54, where did he live between 47 and? No, because the schools were, they voted to build a school there in 51. Yeah, yeah. Don't know. Any other questions? Well, I find it interesting that he was a furniture maker at one point. Yes. Well, that would have a lot to do with casting a patent maker to make you look, your patents. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You'd have to be pretty close to a furniture maker to be able to yeah. make all that. Yes. We still have Gurney as well. The Gurney Company. TV Gurney. Down on Washington Street. No. That makes, they're the longest single producing nail and buckle maker in the country. Really? Yeah. That's a new one on me. Where are they yeah, they're, located? They're right next to uh, Tom McKinnon's funeral home. Oh. It's the building, the two buildings set back from the road. Really? It's a big piece of lawn in the front. Yeah, the oldest large oldest continuous buckle and specialty nail and rivet and things like that maker in the country. You should have a program on them. It's funny, the Gurney family, I still do work for them. Yeah. And David's the last one, he's the fourth generation. They still have a steel gate inside front door and you can't go by it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't want to tell their secret. Oh, that's but, very interesting. Yeah, they used to tumble the tacks off the flat belt pulley. Yeah. And about three years ago, they had a steam engine that ran it, and they gave it to a museum down in Connecticut. They came up and had to take the roof off the building because the flywheel was 30 feet around. Wow. And when that thing was running, and I've seen it, saw it run, you could stand a nickel up on the, on the flywheel. Huh. It wouldn't fall over. But it would run all the tumblers and everything through there. It was like, well, back, going back to maybe the 60s, I might have done 50,000 box tags for them every quarter. Now I do 2,500 for them every year and a half. Yeah. So, and, and most of their tax are being imported now because it takes eight years to be a tax maker, the apprenticeship. Really? Yeah, nobody would have, yeah, it's quite, that's quite an interesting place. Eventually, David will open up. It takes time. Yeah, yeah. I think they did all the tax. Yes. They did all the tax and the longer burger baskets. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then they closed. 
Yeah. Well, very interesting. I thank you for inviting me. You. He's a great guy. Anytime I want somebody to talk, I call him up. Yes, and that was short notice. <laughs> Yeah, some items I'd like to share. Yes, bring them up. These people live in the house. This happened. Like, this people are in the toll house there. Toll house? No, the house you live in. Helen Helen Morton. Morton. I live in the Helen Morton home. 1953 on Auburn Street. I, hey, nice to see so many people interested in history. And I've never seen so many people in one place that are afraid of refreshments. <laughs> but um, I've just met John, and I didn't know what to expect, so I'm, I'm really pleased that you, so many people turn out. Yeah. So I brought a few items, uh, I'm glad I did, just to display. Um, in the Helen Morton home, built in 1953, I actually just got the pedigree recently from Town Hall. Um, upstairs they just have like a street record or something, nothing interesting at all. And then I went downstairs and I talked to the gal down there. And they gave me the pedigree of the house and the owners and all, and we kind of developed the history of it. There's a crawl space under the addition on the house, and it was full of art supplies and whatnot, and there's actually racks and things that are still there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the, um, there's two rental units on this property. It's located at 519 Auburn Street, across from the, which the, the big, huge white home with the huge, big tree in front of it, I think it used to be like the Masonic house or something, it was like 1868 that was built. And that was, that's the big white home behind where Sathler's was. Okay. Yes. And yes. the Helen Morton home is right across from it. The, the old Toll House estate had the caretaker's property right directly behind Wendy's. And that home is still there and that has kind of like a rambling yeah. addition mm -hmm. in the back and there's a couple of rentals there. And then you have the entrance to the condominiums, and then next to that at 519 is the Helen Morton house. And she was the longtime hostess at the toll house. And from what I understand, due to another historical meeting, there was, a, there was actually a town meeting some years ago when they turned the toll house cookie into the state cookie. Right. They had a lovely, they had a lovely event here at the, at, the, uh, at the library, and I still have the flyer uh, framed at at the house there, and that was a good time. So we have the we have a little museum going on, so we keep the town alive. Oh, that's oh, cool. Nice. Actually, they gave me the big big sign that says Sapphires. That's just like the size of a traffic warning sign. And in the in the breezeway, we have all these items. And I advertise on social media all the time, trying to get new items for it. And I come up, we come up with stuff every now and then, like a oh, trivet. trivet. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. This was a donation in the box. And I got this one off of eBay. This is like 1960, the menu. Lobster, $1.25. Oh, 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 <laughs> dessert included. And iced tea or, or uh, coffee. This was another donation that I got from actually someone local. I don't have his name here, but I have a reference at home. It was like a book all about the Toll House. Oh. Mm -hmm. You're all familiar with the Toll House statue mm -hmm. outside Wendy's? Yes. Mm -hmm. We asked them to we update that for, for, some, for some time. We're getting that fixed for you. That is out for repair right now. Mm -hmm. Dessert menu? You know who designed it? And a gal from the western part of the state came out to give us two plates. It's like a saucer and like a dessert plate that's about this big. And we have this all on the wall at the little mini museum. Postcard can get on eBay all the time. We also have King's Castle Land. Oh. It's hard to get King, it's hard to advertise and try to get King's Castle Land items. Although, how many of those plastic mugs you think they gave out at the uh, snack bar? Or for winning at the arcade and arcade tokens? Believe it or not, it's crazy. I don't have any arcade tokens. So, do you have those? 
So I've got, we've got ticket stubs. Actually, I had a big stack of these. I scavenged these out of one of the one of the outbuildings after they had closed. You have those? I have some of these. Uh, here, well, I can give you these two. You can put them in your your part, or you can kind of part them out as a gift among the, among the uh, the members and things like that. So anyway, this this house uh, is going up for sale this summer, early June, and with the breezeway and all the items that we have, this is just a sampling. We have the the original uh, tear sheets, full sheets from the newspaper, like when the toll house burned down and the sale of King's Castle land and things like that. We also have some of the memorial, some of the, some of the artifacts from Jacob, uh, Ralph Jacobson, who bought the house in like 1965. I mean, he had it for about 10 years, and they had art classes that they had in the addition to the house. So the house has two rental units on it, and it's a separate entrance built onto the house. And the breezeway that connects it is where the museum is. It's 519 Auburn Street. So this is how you'll get it. You'll see my photo signed on the lawn. But also, from King's Castle Land, I was advertising for items, and a fellow, fellow called me up, and he said, I have something for you to, for building, and I'm like, I was intrigued. So I ended up buying it. Now, when you see this house at 519 Auburn, just pull up, look up the driveway. In the shed in the back, we, have, we, have, we recreated one of, the, uh, one of the fun houses for the kids in it, because I'm, I'm envious of my neighbor behind the convenience store on the other side of CVS. They have one of the original homes from um, King's Castle Inn, and then we have the, the, uh, the Ferris wheel down the street and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So those artifacts are still around, but the shed, we have took the garden shed and made it into a big building, and the facade, I have it on my phone, I don't know if people can see it. The facade to the, to the shed is I advertised for that, and I had a, a person, yeah, like I said, he called me and I says, they have some building material. And what it was, was the fiberglass and stainless steel wrapping for the bumper house, for the bumper cars from oh. King's Castle Land. It's all red and white with diamonds. Yeah. And this stuff is pristine. It looks like it's new because it was made, the bands were made with stainless steel. And the items were fiberglass, so I polished that with like auto, with the um, auto part, auto conditioners, and then I waxed it. Looks really nice. And then we made special pennants. It says King's Castle Land. So we're trying to keep on the property. We're trying to keep the history of the town alive. And like I said, it's going to be up for the house is going to be up for sale this summer. So I always hoping that someone will say, well, that's historical and they may like the breezeway or I've got a lot of kids, the kids just say, get that junk out of there. Because we've got sports banner, sports banners and things like that in the breezeway as well. Is it Maybe one day have a field trip. Sponsor a couple of things like coffee, wine, and meeting. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Nice to see everybody. I'm gonna cut out my son. I mean, yeah, I didn't want to spend the time with it. Oh, easy it is. <laughs> John, you can do that about coffee. Yeah. So thank you. I'd yeah, like to read that. Yeah. I mean, they had a dairy in town. Yeah. A long time. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So I'd like to reconnect at some point, and okay. like I say, people can stop by and look at all the other trivia that we have. Is it the Cape? Is up like a little hill that's got the black mailbox? On the yeah, we have, I put that up for Tom on yeah. my streets, and, and those these mailmen they they still shut their vehicle off. Even they only step up like two steps right. out of the truck, they right. shut it off. They're running right. out, so make it easy for Tom. He's a really nice, nice person. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, anyway, go on, go on yeah, so we'll, uh, like, we have a field trip to the, to the house or something sometime, and okay. we'll have special. We can look up. We can probably look at home. We can just take a look at some people that are still involved with it. That's our house. Possibly we get personal connection to the cause. And I'll start down to see your music. Okay. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a couple of things that came up, like the Whitman Foundry. The two guys that own the foundry, the two brothers right now, they're kind of pardon the expression, hot shits. <laughs> One lives down in Bowen, and as I say, it was very wealthy people who own places like that. Uh, they're very wealthy. He has a hobby. He has 14 antique cadets. 
Oh. And his brother drives Lamborghinis. Lamborghinis. Yeah, yeah, two. So they kind of, they kind of, I still do work for them. They still do the sand castings. John, yes. I know there were two deer there originally. Do you have I've only seen idea? one there all my life. Now. There's only one there now, but there were two. I always wondered where the second one went. Yeah, they made, they made the panther. It was at the high school. Oh, did yeah, they? Cool. Mm -hmm. But also, if you ever go to Dan Tuckett Square, yeah. the square, they made all the lamp posts. Mm -hmm. Dan Tuckett Square. Did they make all those horses' heads that everybody had to tie their horse to? Uh, they might have stuck already in the ground with yeah. a couple of hoops on it. Yeah, I have, a, I have a lamp post to pull up. I had it for. <laughs> It's been in my barn. You can't pick it up. You need a machine to pick it up. It's been in there. It'll someday go up. Yeah. But there's another thing that they made down at the foundry. It's kind of odd. I mean, way, way back, they made cannonballs. Yeah. They're still making cannonballs today. You know what for? Display. Yeah, they make cannonballs. For burials at sea. That's right. Oh, yeah. Put it in with the body so it goes to the body. Why bother oh, yeah. making a cannonball? Why not just a brick? <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> and another topic that uh, Atlantic Research, and I started my family back in the early 60s. I lived on the other side of Halifax from where Atlantic Research was. The printing business wasn't that good back then. So three nights a week I did security guard work. Going into Atlantic Research was all woods and at 10 o'clock about five or six or three times a night. And at that particular time they had enough ammo in there to blow Halifax off the map. They were bringing back all the uh, shells from Vietnam that weren't going off. And they had a cannon down there and they shot it. And there we go. So it's amazing how you can get in contact with to be around long enough with everything that happens in town. Now, Atlantic Research, I'm listening about the um, fireworks place. I, first of all, thought that was, have they have anything to do with each other? Atlantic Research bought. George J.J., I believe, sold his business in 1950. Uh, Atlantic Research was down there for for a number of years, and uh, I actually bought stock in the company to try to find out what they were doing. They made nose cones for, for missiles. Uh, they were into highly technical stuff. Um, and of course, they, they did make mines for Vietnam down right. there as oh, well. Yeah. But Atlantic Research was very secretive. They owned they the brickyard too. Is that behind my help? I live right there at, at where that plant is. It's kind of like in my front yard. Uh, now it's all stripped clean. Uh, and the the um, federal government paid a couple of farms to uh, raise more cows. They stripped it for the, to make hay in there. And then they got it all done, and the federal government paid a couple of farms to kill all the cows because it were producing too much milk. <laughs> so it's a big circle. Any other questions? No. But Atlantic Research, John, did they take that house high down school? to make room for the school, or was that already gone? The they, they, they bought that, and I believe it, and there's a thing there I put on the far corner. In 1951, the town meeting voted to build four schools at one town meeting. But was the house and the prices are on there. Oh, what do you want to know? Was the house still there? Oh, it's just one they put on. They, 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 cleared the, they cleared the property. Because yeah. in the basement was big, heavy vaults. Yeah. Mm. And it tells you all the stuff that was on there. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was quite a place. You no, know, that was just a, a sign of, like, D.B. Gertie had two beautiful mansions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, there was like, about 10 of them in town. And they were all wealthy business owners back then. That's when you could make money in a business. You can't make money in a business anymore. <laughs> and you had what? What was where um, Diamond Fuel? That was Jenkins' house? Well, I'm not sure which house is. Well, it's not a house anymore. But right, they, wait, wait a few. I think that was the Jenkins. Uh, yeah, because the old South Avenue went around. Yeah. Behind. 
It wasn't, they, they straightened it. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the bell foundry was, right? That's yeah, where, yeah, behind that. Yeah. You, would you like to give a report, you were just, <laughs> okay. kind of wave your hands, right? <laughs> you were our secretary, I think, right from the beginning, oh, 20 years ago. Oh, I meant to give this to the girl that just left about the hill. Oh, actually, the. I think it was in that corner. I think it is. What's that? I hate to say this, but the, the, the minutes that I uh, have to have accepted was four years ago. <laughs> uh, let me look at my glasses on. I'm just... Okay. Uh, May 2nd, 2018. John spoke to 21 people attending the meeting. He, uh, uh, there will be no summer meetings. Membership dues are $15 for a single, 20 for a family. During the summer, an area room will be opened for an office and a museum room. Inventory work to be sorted from collections donated over recent years. Our speaker, Leslie Molino, <laughs> showed glass plates used years ago. He presented slides taken from surrounding towns that are old pictures from, from in his book, Thomas Drew's South Shore, to be sold at Barnes & Noble. Drew was a storekeeper in Hanover. Respectfully submitted Eunice McSweeney, secretary. And I wanted to mention three things. Uh, the miniature replica of King's Castle Land that is in our museum now, it was donated by Clarence Whitney. And uh, also in 2021, yes, uh, last year the reading room was added to the museum and uh, all of our uh, books from town are there. And also, the class of 1971 had a 50th reunion in the museum. Yes, they did. Uh, those items are just extra things that I thought you might be interested in. Now, that was just this form. They called me and, and they had about 40 people show up. And we opened the, the museum for them. And uh, they went about the pizza and salad and had it on the boulevard. Yep. They reminisced on the boulevard. That's <laughs> nice. It must have been really nice. So it worked out pretty good. They really enjoyed themselves. So anyway, if I just need the acceptance of the minutes. So moved. Everybody? Okay. <laughs> All right, so anybody hasn't been in the museum as it is now, there's a picture of it. I'll put it on the front counter. <laughs> And I kind of forgot how the room has been so long. So maybe we could have a sign-in sheet up front here as you're kind of milling around on the back side of one of these. I'm trying to update the mailing list from the little pieces I got. And that's what these were sent out in the mail for. I didn't mind, I didn't mean to bring, to get cash. I just wanted your information. For seeing you giving me cash, I'll take it. But that, that'll be for next year. So I was going to start, because we have the meetings around the So I was going to start the, the next September. We'll start a new year, and, and dues bills will be due then. So anybody that paid now is all paid up for next year. Okay. Any other questions? I got a new plate in my mouth, too. <laughs> Any other questions? No other questions? Natalie has made a brief. Uh, but, That's first come, first set. Yeah. Yes, and also, I, I should have made more. I didn't know how many, uh, what was going to go on in here. Well, so, no, I do, but I was well, not to put more than Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so anybody who would like to be on the board of directors and sign up a sheet up here, anybody that. Uh, Wants to ask me more questions, I'll try and answer them. Yeah. I think you know perfect. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to direct it. Well, we're doing good. The light, we have, we're going to have to get out of the 7th so I Okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, so we'll go around. It's kind of interesting to read that 
about the uh, mansion and uh, what it did. What, what the town did when they bought four schools of one town meeting. And those were like three or four hundred thousand dollars. You buy a school today, it's three hundred million dollars. Crystal Clemens going in for a hundred and some odd million dollars. I mean, can you picture that? In the construction life cycle is probably a lot more short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. The laws you have to come in and do now. And then the, who you can hire and who you can't hire. It's an it's interesting world today. And you can't get enough people to come to your town meeting. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, actually, they have the quorum count there 400 and some odd people. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Well, the, at that quorum time, count. there was nothing going on. 400 people. But that's what they needed for a quorum. Yeah. And now most, most towns are down to 100, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Between 100 and 150, we can't get that. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, you've you got to take the, the generation gaps. The, uh, the, say the 30 year old people, they just don't want to work. They don't care about the towns. They don't want to live in a house, they want to live in a condo. So somebody moves their lawn for them. I mean, I'm talking about every one of them, but. Most of them, that's the way they want to be. They don't want to have a house, they have to go to one once a week. And uh, it's a whole different generation. And they make too much money. And some of these people, man, I never made that kind of money in my life. But uh, it's a different generation. So anyways, hang around, talk. We haven't seen each other for a long time. First come, first serve on the refreshments. Yes.